Thank you for joining us at First Baptist Church of Yazoo City. Whether you're watching live or delayed taping, I pray that as you participate in our service, that God speaks to you and works in your life today. Should you need spiritual guidance, please call 888-JESUS-20. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day. I want you to know how honored we are to have you here. And we have some, there's some white pads at the end of each pew. It's a register. And if you're a guest, if you wouldn't mind taking one of those and filling out that information for us and just leave it on the pew. Um, if you're a First Baptist member and you see guests on your row, if you would be so kind as to make sure they get one of those as, as you introduce yourselves to them as well, we would appreciate that. We're looking forward to what God has in store for us today. We're going to stand today as we begin singing, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Let's go. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your lead, leading us this week and being with us. Father, our prayer this morning as we come is there's anyone here this morning doesn't know you, doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that they come to know you. 
Father, speak to our hearts this morning through your word. And Lord, we come this morning with grateful hearts and thankful hearts. And we worship you, almighty God. There's none like you. Lord, thank you for your love. Lead and guide us and help us to be the church, Lord, that you would have us to be. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the midst of the darkest hours, when the world seems to be at its worst, God's people have always sung. It's what they did. The Israelites did it in captivity, Paul and Silas in prison. And even today, as we look around and see all the bad things happening, we still stand on the assurance that, folks, we win. In the end, we win because he won the battle for us. And we continue to bless his name and sing his praises. Let's stand together as we sing this confession. In Christ alone, my hope is found on Christ the solid rock. Oh, my hope is found. 
we stand on the solid rock, we also stand upon his word. So I ask that you would join me this morning in the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. So if you can get to Matthew and hang a left, you will eventually come to Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. It's great to be back with you. It's this morning, enjoyed not being with you. Uh, I don't take that offensively, but it was good to be gone. And always good to get back with you. Do appreciate Lewis uh, giving me 20 extra minutes from last week, and uh, I may take all those today. I may spread it out over a couple weeks, but uh, I do appreciate that. Malachi chapter 1, join with me beginning in verse 6. A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is the priest who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering food defiled on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying, The Lord's table is defiled, and it's, of its food it is contemptible. And you say, What a burden, and you stiff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. One of the best meals that you can have is that of leftovers. You know, some things taste better the second time around. And there's probably not a man that hadn't walked past a pizza box from leftover from the night before at breakfast the following morning, and cereal doesn't sound very good. Maybe even biscuits and eggs and bacon, whatever, mind. But that, you know, you're not going to get that. So that pizza looks pretty good, and it tastes pretty good the second time. And Maybe even you finish cleaning up at supper, and you've got leftovers, and you immediately think, there's lunch for tomorrow. Now, some of you are thinking, I wish we had some leftovers. If you knew who ate at my house. But go back to when it was just maybe you and your spouse before kids, and it's so hard to cook things for two or three people, and, and you cook, and it just continued to grow, and you ate, and you ate, and it didn't feel like you made, made much of a dent on what you had cooked, and so you put it up, and you were going to eat it the next day, and you did at lunch, and it was good, and you still had some left, and so maybe even you got home that night, so you know what, that was good last night, and it was good at lunch, let's just have it again tonight, there's no reason to fix something else, and so you ate it, and let's just say that next day there was still some left and you decided to have it at lunch. I'm going to tell you, at that point, what once was good is no longer good. You get tired of eating those same things over and over again. What was great to start with, as it, the longer it became a leftover, the worse it became. I'm going to ask you about that in the spiritual realm. How often do we give God what's left over? of our time, of our energy, of our efforts, of our possessions, of everything that we have as, we, as they're all belong to God. How often do we come at the end of a week or at the end of a day and go, well, Lord, this is all I've got left for you. We're going to begin. I ask you today to pick up a copy of a small book called I Will. I Will. It's this book here. Many of you read I'm a Church Member. This is the follow-up to I'm a Church Member. We're going to begin looking at this over the next few weeks. It's a real short book. It's written by the head of Lifeway, so you know it's not very deep. And um, you can read this fairly quickly. Uh, ladies, you're probably still going to have to read it to your husbands, okay? Let's just let's be honest. 
I ask you to pick up one of these things and you would begin to work through it. To look at nine traits of an outwardly focused Christian and nine traits of what should be an outwardly focused church. I've heard a couple times in the last few weeks, I'm a, I'm a church member. Because I'm a church member, I, and we think that there's rights that come along with being a church member. Let me warn you, being a church member brings responsibility. It's not rights. It's not things to say, oh, I get to do this, this, and this. Because really there's not a lot of rights that come along with it. But there's a whole lot of responsibility that comes along with being a church member. And I'm afraid so often in our walk with the Lord, and therefore in our relation with the church, what we would say we give to God, if we're honest, is our leftovers. And just as he, as we get tired of eating the same thing over and over, God gets tired of us bringing such leftovers to him. But what's wrong with that? At least I'm giving God. God doesn't want all of me, does he? So I think what has infiltrated our church is what is known as moral therapeutic deism. And not just infiltrated our church, it's infiltrated the church. Moral therapeutic deism says three things in their list. That they're, number one, that God exists. Number two, he's nice, and he wants me to be nice. But number three, God's not relevant to my daily life unless I need him. He exists, no doubt about it. He is nice. He wants us to be nice. But he's not relevant to my life until I have a need. And then he quickly shows up, and he takes care of my need, and then he goes back to being distant and irrelevant again. And so therefore, Jesus becomes to many believers a friend, a buddy, who brings them good things. He becomes a little buddy that you pull out of your pocket in the midst of a crisis, and he makes it poof, he makes it disappear, and then you put him back in your pocket. And I don't think it's a front pocket, I think it's a back pocket. Because in the front pocket, you know he's going to be there. You're going to, you're going to sense him, you're going to bump into things. But in the back pocket, you just sit on him. And you pull him out when you need him. Kind of like when you pull out your, your checkbook, your wallet, because you've got to pay for something. There's a crisis, oh no, so I pull out God. Lord, I need you to heal this person. I need you to take care of this situation. I need you to make this go away. And then when it happens, he goes back in our pocket, out of sight, out of mind. I've been reading a book that talks about teenagers, <clears throat> the reason teenagers leave the church, which is we've talked about, it's a huge problem today. One Speaker said these words, why do teenagers leave the church? Because they can. Because they have not been ruined by Jesus and for Jesus. They can walk away from him and the church. That doesn't apply just to teenagers because, see, teenagers mirror the faith of the important people in their lives. And most of them, yes, have not been ruined by Jesus. I love that phrase, ruined by Jesus and for Jesus. Because they haven't seen adults that have been ruined by Jesus and for Jesus. So what they have seen and what we often portray is a faith that is a half-hearted commitment. That's what Malachi is talking about in this passage in Malachi 1. The Israelites have been back from exile for several years. The temple's rebuilt. The city has protection. But the people have forgotten the commands of God. And Malachi, Malachi closes the prophetic records by charging, charging the people of robbing God. That's the overall theme of the book. And in chapter 1, he addresses, addresses this issue of half-hearted commitment, the people not giving God their best. And again, I believe that may be the number one problem within the church today. And the reason that we lose foothold in our world and the reason things have happened the way that they have is because we are okay with cheating God and giving Him a half-hearted commitment. A preacher, those are pretty bold words. Yeah, they are. Because I had to point out that as Malachi is addressing these words, he's addressing these, people, this, these words to the people that were closest to God. In verse 6, it is you priest who show contempt for my name. It's you preachers who are showing contempt for my name. The spiritual leaders, you're the ones that are doing this. It's a warning to us that gather in a place to worship the Lord and give Him the praise that He's due, that you and I can fall into the trap of having a half-hearted commitment and thinking that God is okay with it. For we have Jesus 
We have more than these folks who heard these words. Jesus says we are a nation of priests, a royal priesthood. Because we have access to God now through Jesus. And so it can be us, those who can be closest to God, who can fall into this trap. What occurs when we have a half-hearted commitment? That's what I want us to look at in these verses. First of all, we see we have a half-hearted commitment. We give others what God will not take. Malachi begins by addressing the issue of sacrifice. Sacrifice should be a, a loving response to love received. And the Israelites' response was to bring animals who were blind, who were crippled, and who were diseased. Imagine the parade of diseased animals with oozing sores covered with flies heading toward the temple. People saying, this is my offering. It's what I'm giving to God today. God was not pleased because the people knew better. For in Leviticus, numerous places of Leviticus 22, they were told, you bring the best you got, that with no defect. They knew They'd been taught the law. They knew they could not bring things that nobody else would take, yet that's what they were bringing to God. Malachi's talking about honor. The son honors his father, a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm the master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. You do what your father says. You do what your slave says. Why aren't you doing what I say? Is the charge that God brings to them. And then he asked them to consider their gifts, if they would be suitable for their secular state governor. Let them try to get away with such a disrespectful act toward one who is placed in authority over them. Yet here they are, trying to do this with the creator and the ruler of the universe. They knew they couldn't go pay their taxes with such an animal. They couldn't go pay half of their taxes. They couldn't take to the governor and say, here's the honor that's due you, something that was... Such deplorable conditions as these animals. And yet, they thought that God would be satisfied with them. It'd be like us today, writing the IRS, and saying, I've decided I'm just going to pay half of my taxes. You may get to stay local right out here in the federal prison if you do that. It'd be like telling your boss, you know what? 40 hours a week, It's just too much. So I'm going to start working 30, but you're going to pay me for 40, okay? Don't try that. Wouldn't recommend it. But you're telling your spouse, listen, you know, being your husband or your wife for seven days a week is pretty rough. So since I work five, you just bother me for two, okay? That's not going to go over very well. And that's what Malachi is saying here. Try giving someone an authority, someone you honor, someone you respect what you're giving to God and see if you think that they're going to be pleased. And you know that they're not going to be. Therefore, God is not pleased when we bring a half-hearted commitment to Him. I was sitting in class one time, seminary class. A student did not receive the grade that they wanted. And they approached the professor after class. Not in a very quiet way, so we all heard the conversation. He went on to say, you know what, I, I don't like the grade that I got here. I think you're grading too hard. So, you know, I, I work full time and I pastor in a church and I have a family and I'm going to school on top of that. And I think your expectations are just way too high. And the professor looked at him and said, when you turned this paper in, did you know that it was far less than my expectations? The student looked at him and said, yes, I knew it fell below your standards. The professor said, I tell you what then, you give me second-rate papers, I give you second-rate grades. And I think the Lord looks at us and says, when you give me a second-rate effort, then you have a second-rate relationship with me. When you give me what nobody else will take, you can't expect to have a relationship that is thriving, that is close, and that is intimate with me. And again, we think that we offer God the second best, that that's good enough. Our Sunday school class this morning, we looked at Jesus' words at church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, and essentially he tells them that good enough is not good enough. That good can take the place of best. If they were doing all these good things, but they had forsaken their first love, 
They were standing up against false teachers. They were being persecuted, and yet they were not becoming weary. They were doing great things outside, but it was a matter of the heart. And let's not forget, those closest to God can fall into this trap of settling for something that's good when God calls us to what is best. Good enough seldom is good enough. That's why Paul would write in Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your might. God wants us to give him not a half-hearted commitment, but a full-hearted, full-surrender commitment to him. Notice what else happens when we have a half-hearted commitment. And that's that God's name is cursed. In verse 11, verse 14, when God mentions sacrifices, he follows it with the phrase, I will be great, or you will be feared. Or excuse me, I will be feared. So he's saying, as you come with sacrifices and you worship me, my name is going to be made known. There's going to be respect for me. There's going to be awe for me. But that's not happening. Notice verse 12. But you profane it, speaking of his name, by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, well, what a burden. And you stiffen it, sniff it contemptuously. You profane the name. Profane means to desanctify. To make her to treat something as unholy, to treat something like it's uncommon, it's, or like it is common, or it's insignificant, to treat something like it is worthless. And he says, when you come offering me what nobody else will take, you profane my name, my holy name, that is to be great and is to be feared. Instead, it's made a name that is treated like a common name on the street, a name you just throw out. God's name is being cursed causing him to want to shut the doors to the temple. In verse 10, Oh, that you would just shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. The Lord is saying, don't even bother coming. You have profaned my name. You have cursed my name to the point where somebody please shut the door so these people cannot continue to come in here and dishonor my name. Someone's name is what makes them unique. It's what makes them special. It's what makes them significant. To lose that quality is the ultimate humiliation. I was eating with the pastor friend several years ago. The waitress came up and she said her name, and I can't remember her name for the life of me. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm going to take care of you. And this guy looked right at her and said, do you know that your name means pure? And I thought, where is he going with this? Until he quickly said, are you pure? The change in her demeanor was pretty safe, sure, pretty safe to say that she was not she never returned to our table again. Why? I believe it was because she was humiliated when she realized that she was not living up to her name. And the Lord looks. He knows he's holy, he's exalted, he's high and lifted up. There is no name greater than his name. And he sees these people, and he's reminding them over and over again, he is the Lord Almighty, most powerful God that there is, and yet they are bringing him things that curse his name. They are bringing him things that allow his name not to be what it should be. They are bringing humiliation upon his name. We know the Ten Commandments, the one that says, Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. We usually associate that with using God's name in a curse word to follow it. And that's definitely part of it and definitely something that should not be part of our vocabulary. But we take the name of the Lord our God in vain when we present to Him a half-hearted commitment. When we don't give God our best, we as children of God wearing His name bring dishonor to that name. When we just approach him haphazardly, and we are so focused on the other things going on around us that we neglect that first love, his name is cursed. It is taken in vain. We need to understand the seriousness of the charges that the Lord brought to the people of Israel and could bring to us today. 
Another thing we see that occurs when we have a half-hearted commitment is that worship becomes a burden. Instead of counting it as a privilege to minister on God's behalf, these priests are exclaiming, verse 13 says, What a burden! What a burden! It was more trouble than it was worth in their minds. We have to go again today and accept sacrifices. We have to go today and take another animal down there. How this trip becomes so burdensome. And I can't imagine that God looks down at them and says, How did you become so bored with me? What happened? That you became so bored with me that it became a burden for you to give me the worship that I deserve. See, God expected sacrifices. He expected the offerings to be taken from his good gifts that he had given to the people and to be returned to him. These sacrifices presented one's love and their loyalty and their honor. But also it presented their sorrow for sin and wrongdoing as they came and gave these things to God. They showed an inner commitment to the relationship between God and his people. It didn't come from duty, but it came from devotion. And when duty replaces devotion, human nature is such that it begins to take minimum steps, barely enough to make an obligation. So that the people could say, oh, what a burden it is to worship. But we went and did it because we took an animal there. They took one that was maimed or diseased or crippled, one that nobody else would take. The opposite is a true love relationship where you seek to do the maximum for the one who is loved. The Lord would let us know several places. David understood it in Psalm Psalm 51 that the Lord desires obedience more than sacrifice. And today, you and I don't bring sacrifices because the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, died on the place, died on the cross, the place for our sins. And we don't have to bring the sacrifices anymore, but instead now the sacrifices of God are a contrite heart. A humble heart is what God looks for us to bring to Him. And He is more concerned with our obedience than He wants the things that we can bring. See, we're commanded to worship. It's not a choice. That's why God created us, was for us to worship Him. And part of that command is that there needs to be a private life and a corporate aspect of worship. To live a well-balanced Christian life, you must have both. You must have the corporate setting, this setting, but you must have that private time, you and God. And you have to find the balance there between. You can't just have one or the other and expect to say that you worship. Because worship is everything that we do. Everything that we do should bring honor to God, which therefore that is worshiping God. But how often does our worship become burdensome? Sunday's here. It's the day to go to church. Oh Lord, I don't want to have to get up early to spend time with you. See, the greatest worship services I believe in Scripture, too, we've looked at in the past few months, Abraham and, and Isaiah. Abraham, when he sacrifices Isaac, Isaiah, when he's in the temple of the Lord, and he sees the majesty and the greatness of God, and he hears, who can I send? Who will go for us? In both instances, these men reply, here I am. Abraham, as he's about to jab the knife in his son Isaac to sacrifice him as the Lord called him to, when he hears Abraham, he responds, Here I am, that willingness that is there. Isaiah, one of the darkest times of the nation's life, and King Uzziah has died, a godly king who has led them greatly. There's all the uproar and, and wondering what's next. He goes into the temple of the Lord, and he encounters the Lord. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am. Send me. Both of these men stepping up, answering God's call, they show us how to worship. Because any time that we gather for worship in a private sense or in a corporate sense, and we're not convicted, and we're not challenged by the Holy Spirit, and then we make an answer, we answer in a commitment to call Upon him we have not worshipped. 
We can come to this setting over and over. We can sing. We can give. We can stand. We can shake hands. We can have a good time. You can take notes. You can do everything outwardly that you're supposed to do and you're asked to do. But when we come here and we are not convicted and we're not challenged by the Holy Spirit and we are not led to answer His call upon our lives, then we have not worshipped. And it becomes a burden to us to continue to gather. Oftentimes we don't experience that conviction. We don't get that challenge because worship has become a burden. And we give God the leftovers. For we come to the corporate worship time when nothing else is going on. When we have nothing else to do. We spend time with God at the last part of our day. And many times we'll find ourselves praying as we go to sleep and we wake up and go, huh, I didn't pray very long, did I? Because we're giving him the leftovers of what we have at the end of the day. And we expect him again to be pleased with that. But we curse his name and our worship becomes a burden to us. But there's one more thing. And that's that we expect God to be pleased. When we have a half-hearted commitment, the question is asked in verse 13. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices... Should I accept them from your hands? When you give me the leftovers, when you give me what no one else will take, should I take them? The answer to the question was yes to them. They probably would never say it's not recorded, but their actions proved yes, that's what we expect for you to take it. For whatever reason, they thought that God would accept this slap in the face and be pleased with a little bit of worship that was there. See, David teaches us in 2 Samuel 24 that sacrifices that cost nothing avail for nothing. Because sacrifices that cost nothing are an oxymoron, first of all. But sacrifices that cost nothing avail to nothing. David has just sinned. He counted his troops. He wanted to see how large his army was. It was a proud moment. The moment where he sinned, he realized that he was dependent upon those troops and not dependent upon the Lord continuing to bring him victory. A nation of Israel, a plague is sent throughout them because of David's sin. And word is sent to David to go to a man's house, to his threshing floor, and to build an altar there and to worship the Lord. And when he did, the plague stopped. But when he got there, that man said, yeah, come on in. There's the threshing floor. Here's the wood that you'll need. Here's everything you need to build the altar. By the way, here's an oxen you can sacrifice. Anything you need is yours, majesty. And David said, uh-uh. I will not sacrifice anything to God that doesn't cost me. David says, I don't need your stuff. Because I'm bringing a sacrifice to God out of my stuff. And there David sacrificed something that cost him. If we look at our worship and we look at our commitment to God, if it doesn't cost us, it's not a sacrifice, it's not a commitment. God is not pleased. Several years ago, it was a Thursday afternoon, I was meeting with a Fellowship of Christian Athletes group. That evening at the school was parent-teacher conferences. Report cards were coming out. At the end, someone asked if we had any prayer requests. One kid popped up and said, yeah. Y'all need to be praying for me, and he named his buddy. He said, because our grades aren't good. And mama's not going to be happy, and coach is not going to be happy. Y'all need to be praying for us. The other kids chimed in. Oh, that is tonight, isn't it? Coach, can we practice longer? We don't want to go home. Why? Because they knew their parents' expectations. They knew the effort they had put in. And they knew what the results were going to be. When we look at our lives, we know what God expects from us. A full surrender of our life to Him. That begins with a personal relationship with Him where we admit to Him that we're a sinner. We believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and He rose three days later. Defeating sin, defeating death. And we confess, we make Him the Lord, the Savior of our life. We make Him the boss of our life. That's where it begins. And then it's a continual walk with the Lord. All those times where we fail and we ask for forgiveness and He pours out His grace upon us. There's times of difficulty and we just bless His name as we sang earlier. 
We praise Him. We see God show up, work in ways that He can. But we know what His expectations are, and deep down, we know that He doesn't want the leftovers. Deep down, we know that God is repulsed by a half-hearted commitment. And we know He's not pleased because He says He's not pleased. Cursed is the cheat, he says in verse 14. The curse is considered a curse because of what we miss out on. God is saying his name is going to be great regardless of what we do. The party will go on without you is what he's saying. He told Israel that his greatness and his grace would be given to the Gentiles. And we've seen that happen throughout history and continue to happen even now. God's curse may not necessarily be a physical mark, but you know God's curse. You know when he's not pleased. For you don't sense his presence. Feels like your prayers don't get above the ceiling. You haven't had a fresh word from God. Your spiritual life is dry. Maybe you're depressed. Feeling down about yourself because you know you're not doing what God wants you to do. We know those feelings. It becomes hard to even consider anything about the Lord. And we experience this curse. But thanks be to God, dude, His grace. That can be removed. And we can know the joy of the Lord. And we can live a life of abundance as He came to call us to. And our life can be completely changed. We're told when you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill the vow in Ecclesiastes 5. What do you need to fulfill? What commitment have you made that's just half-hearted? God's calling you today to fulfill that vow. See, it all comes down to this. When we get a glimpse of the greatness of God, we get a glimpse of all that Jesus has done for us, we'll never play church again. We will give him all that we've got for the rest of our lives. And our lives will be changed. When I was in junior high for two years. I went to football camp at Washtenaw Baptist University. At this point, I had surrendered to the ministry. And that's where I was going to go to school. And in my plan, I was going to go to school there, and I was going to play football there. And I was going to be so good, they were going to pay me to come to school there. None of that happened. Uh, I had a cousin who went there, was all American there, and I looked up to him, and I went to camp first year. They introduced us to the head coach, who was Hall of Fame coach, and I walked up to him later. I said, Coach Benson, I told him who my cousin was. I said, I'm going to come back and play for you one day. The eighth grade year, I remember going through and had a good time and found out at the end of the week they gave out a hustle award. They didn't tell us this. So that next year, I was going to win that award. And I went to camp, and every time the whistle blew, I was the first person in line. Anytime they needed something, I went and got it. I was going to win that stinking award. That was going to get me the scholarship that I knew was coming my way. I had a buddy who was with me, one of my closest friends in that stage of life. He spent more time at the trainer's table than he spent going through the drills. Always was getting hurt. He was t lazy. He was tired. It was hot. I thought, well, I know he's not going to win it. I'm not sure about the rest of the guys. This is going to be my award. The Friday morning the camp came, had the award ceremony. And my buddy won that award, the Hustle Award. All I can remember thinking is that he, he spent more time at the trainer's table than he spent in the drills. What's the problem here? So afterwards... All the coaches coming through, telling you, you know, I appreciate you being there, all that kind of stuff. And the lineman coach came through. I said, Coach, what else do I got to do? I've been here two years. I ain't gotten that award yet. I remember mean, looking at me and saying, you did a lot of good stuff. But I knew that you could do more. Folks, when I stand before the Lord, as each of us is going to stand before him, I don't want him to go, Clint, you know, you pastored some great churches. People were saved. But most importantly, you were a good father. 
You're a good husband. I want to hear those things, but I don't want to hear. But you could have done more. But instead you gave me what nobody else would take. You gave me the leftovers. And to know that as I stand before the holy throne of God, that I cursed his name, expecting him to be pleased. Today, if the Lord returns or your life ends and you stand before his throne, and we answer for every spoken word, Scripture says, would he look at you and say, oh, you've done some good things. You served in the church. You taught classes. You attended worship. You were a good parent. You were a good spouse. But you could have done more. Let's move from a half-hearted commitment today. And let's worship God in our response to his word and asking for forgiveness, not in a way that's burdensome, but in a way that brings us joy because we get to experience the grace of God upon our life. And we know that as we worship him with a full-hearted commitment, God's pleased. As we respond to his word, would you prepare your heart to do that? Let us pray. Holy God, we bow before you. And I'm so thankful for your love and your grace. Thankful that you use somebody unworthy as me. And you use and perfect people like those of us gathered here. But Lord, you call us to give you the best, not simply what's good. Father, as we bow in your presence, pour out your grace. For we have cursed your name and expected you to be pleased. Forgive us for the times when worship has become such a burden. Maybe, even Lord, it was that, that way for many gathered here today. Or pour out your grace upon us right now. Forgive us. Lord, may we be marked by full surrender to you. And in just a minute, as we stand and sing the song, that it's not just some words, but it's our story, it's our commitment to you. Let us be marked by full surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as we sing an old song, I Surrender All, may this be our commitment to God. If you have a public decision to make, would you come quickly this morning? May God be pleased with our worship.
Father, we do thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for your word, how it convicts us. I pray that you would help us as we go about our lives every day to give you our best. We pray now that you would bless these offerings and use them to your kingdom's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
does say, I challenge you today, if you're here, you don't have a relationship with me. I'm going to love to share with you how to have such a relationship. I'll be in the back because everyone leaves and would love to share with you how to experience the grace of Jesus and understand that he does indeed save. As you leave, please don't forget on this table here and in the back uh, to pick up a copy of, of this book and uh, begin to read through that. Also, when you came in today, you were given a sheet of uh, men who are eligible for our deacon election. That will take place next Sunday at the end of our service. I ask for you to take that list and to begin to pray over that list. That's why you're giving it a week early. Those are men who are currently not serving, who are eligible to serve and are willing to serve. And so if you would, uh, please begin praying about the seven men that God would have you to nominate next week. And uh, you'll get that same sheet of paper on a different color, and uh, you'll be able to mark accordingly and ask for you to do that. So please make that a matter of prayer this week. Also this afternoon, make it a matter of prayer. We're going to play softball. It's going to be hot, and we're going to start playing at 4 o'clock. And I've already had one team that's worried and and, uh, trying to find reasons not to show up and praying for rain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they're, they're going to be there, I hope, and I hope they're not afraid of, of my team. And um, so we look forward. We are going to start at 4 and at 5 uh, because we are have a quarterly business meeting this evening. If you are not going to go uh, to the ball games, please be back here around 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have homemade ice cream, so bring your freezer full. We look forward to... Uh, I hate to say look forward to sinning, but that's what we're going to do because we're not just going to stop with what we should eat. And uh, we're going to have a good time together, good fellowship, a lot of eating. And we have some uh, important exciting business things to take care of. So I want to encourage you uh, to be here this evening at 6 o'clock. Come out and watch softball. I always can promise you it's going to be hot, but it's going to be entertaining. And uh, you will get your share of laughs. So look forward to that time together. And as we go, remember we came in here as the church to worship, but now we go to be the church. And there will be attacks, there will be struggles along the way, but let us stand upon the solid rock. Let's stand together as we sing this as we depart. Bye.